Hello and welcome back everyone. This is Tom in Los Angeles. I hope you're doing well. It's uh, August the 6th today, 2021. And uh, in Los Angeles, we've had 105 degrees Fahrenheit, which is interesting for a, for a couple of days. And so I'm enjoying my air conditioning. Grateful that it works. And today we are going to talk about uh, Canto 14 of Purgatorio. Um, a really great, intense canto, very dramatic. Dramatic also for the unique way in which it starts and uh, it, it's structured in a very theatrical way. We can take a quick step back and remember the structure of these recent cantos of Purgatorio. From 10 to 12, those are three cantos that Dante dedicates to pride and humility, 10, 12, uh, 10 11, and 12. Uh, canto 13, Canto 14, and uh, a portion of Canto 15 are dedicated to envy. In fact, uh, these are located on the terrace of envy, the second terrace of Purgatorio. Then the second part of Canto 15 and onward, Dante will dedicate to the sin of wrath and uh, its opposite, which is meekness and gentleness, etc. Uh, following a model that, and a scheme that is similar for each terrace, as, as we've seen. Here we are in Canto 14, which is a particularly intense canto. Every single canto of the Divine Comedy has a peculiar intensity that is rarely found in uh, other poets, because that's Dante. But uh, Canto 14 is very intense in a darker and more bitter way than uh, many other cantos in Purgatorio because Dante talks about politics and ethics and history. Uh, then we'll have Canto 15 that provides a sort of quiet meditation with almost no plot progression. And then 16th again, another very important, very strong, dramatic uh, canto that talks about ethics and politics, just like 14th, only with a more, with a stronger focus on uh, theology and the doctrine of free will. We can also say that Canto 14 is not as much about envy as Canto 13 was. Canto 13 was a really great and beautiful examination of envy in its very aspects. Canto 14, even if we're still on the same terrace, it's more centered around uh, the sad condition of uh, some regions, in particular Tuscany and uh, Romagna, Romagna as it was in Dante's times. These two regions were the most familiar to Dante because he kept traveling around these uh, regions even before his exile. And also after his exile, he's uh, wandering around as a exiled poet, in some cases begging, as a beggar almost, uh, happened and took place for the most part in towns and cities within this region. So he knew these regions very well and this is why he remembers so many names of uh, famous politicians and powerful men of, of these areas. And finally, Canto 14 um, is a canto that I like in particular because it, it shows uh, a lot with a particular degree of intensity Dante's skills in uh, writing in a polysemic way. Uh, the things that he's uh, writing in this canto have uh, many different layers and uh, depending on the angle that you look at them, they will uh, mean something or something else, always within a certain harmonic uh, core of meaning, but in fact, different layers. And uh, I will try, I'll do my best to try and explain what I understand about it. So as I mentioned, this canto starts uh, in a very unique and very theatrical way with this direct dialogue. And uh, Dante starts this dialogue without explaining to us who is speaking, um, why, where, it's a, again almost like reading a theatrical play here and that's uh, unique we never seen this in the divine comedy so far the direct dialogue uh, starts as like this who is this man who although death has yet to grant him flight can circle around our mountain and can at will open and shut his eyes we left the end of uh, canto 13 with the end of the direct dialogue from sapia and now we have a different voice here. It's a different character. Somebody who is asking why, who Dante is and why he's 
able to see in a place where all the souls, including the person who's speaking, is blinded, is blinded by the purgatorial punishment. And uh, he's asking this question to another soul whom we still don't know, who replies, I don't know who he is, but I do know he's not alone. You're closer, question him and greet him gently, so that he replies. Almost immediately, even though this is maybe a little bit uh, clearer in the Italian portion, you can see that even if the, if uh, this second soul has uh, very little to say all throughout the canto, he has a very specific personality. So we have Dante and these two different souls as main characters here, and all three of them have a really strongly connotated personalities and styles of speaking, which is uh, something very typical of uh, good theater. Dante gives us a very quick explanation. Uh, so were two spirits leaning towards each other, discussing me along my right hand side, and they bent back their heads to speak to me, and one began. This is again the first soul who spoke. O soul who still enclosed with the body make your way in a kind way, this soul asks Dante about his identity and where he's coming from. And, and here we get to the first really, really interesting part of the canto from a, uh, from a content point of view, from a meaning point of view, which is Dante's reply. Dante's reply uh, is something to ponder and ponder and ponder again, because uh, I still don't fully understand why and how he does this. In other words, uh, his reply is, through central Tuscany there spreads a little stream, first born in Falterona, I bring this body from the river's banks. To tell you who I am would be to speak in vain. My name has not yet gained much fame. There are three things that Dante does not say to these two souls. His name, the name of his city, and the name of this river. He doesn't say anything. Now, many people have wondered why he is uh, acting like this, he is speaking in this way. It's uh, fairly clear, given that he's already lost the letter P for uh, his sin of pride, that he wants to show here that he's learned his lesson. Not necessarily that he is completely free of pride, but he's learned his lesson and that he realizes that there is a certain uh, status linked to Florence and in general linked to uh, somebody's uh, name sometimes and, uh, and city of origin etc etc so he doesn't say it he doesn't say all this probably to avoid sounding proud and behaving in a proud way at the same time though we have to look closely at this particular sentence that Dante says which is my name has not yet gained much fame some scholars look at this sentence as uh, a way for Dante to show maybe consciously or unconsciously, that he's actually still bragging despite the fact that he's trying not to brag. And he's saying, I'm going to be famous in the future. Some others um, look at it in a more, uh, I think, theological way, and in my opinion, more correct way. Here, we see Dante trying to show that he's learned his lesson, and I think that's correct. And we also see that he is uh, talking about his future fame, however, in a way that is uh, aligned with uh, a certain uh, humility that comes with the mission that he's received from God. In Paradiso, we will see that Dante will be, in fact, uh, officially invested by somebody who is in, in heaven uh, to complete his mission to write the comedy. He's convinced that he is uh, lo scriba di Dio, in other words, the scribe of God. He's writing what God is uh, inspiring him to, to say. And under this uh, point of view, uh, he's not after mundane fame, he's not after a self-aggrandizing for the sake of it, but he's after a uh, success of his mission, not for himself, but for the goals of God, the goals of uh, spreading the good news of the gospel once again, uh, moralizing and uh, helping people understand the, those values that, in his opinion, have been lost in his uh, contemporary times. 
In fact, Dante was surely aware of uh, uh, St. Augustine's opinion about this particular point. Uh, St. Augustine said about uh, fame in uh, works of art and uh, achieving success uh, in works of art in general, he said, uh, the good and just man wants that people admire his own works with the goal of glorifying God, with the goal of glorifying he from whom he received the grace to generate these works, to create these works. Uh, and that's how Dante sees his own uh, role as an artist, as a great artist, as a famous artist. In fact, uh, one of my favorite lines in the Divine Comedy um, is found in Paradiso 17, where Cacciaguida is uh, the person in the soul in uh, heaven who is uh, giving this investiture to Dante as the scribe of God. And the line that I really love goes, Questo tuo grido farà come vento che le più alte cime percuote. This scream of yours will be like wind that hits the highest uh, peaks of the mountains. Um, I love it because uh, he's uh, talking about us. He's talking about all the people who love the Divine Comedy, all the people who love uh, Dante and reading it even today across all these 700 years. And uh, he's calling us uh, the highest peaks, the highest uh, mountains, because we um, are admired by Dante as uh, readers who love the poem that is written. I just found it fantastic how he's talking to us for, through time, through history. So, moving forward, we have um, the first soul uh, speaking again. And uh, given the fact that the names of these souls are coming up only later, let's call them with their names. The first soul's name is uh, Guido. He's Guido del Duca, and uh, he's uh, from Romagna, from this region called Romagna, from uh, an area ne near Forli. And the other soul, the second who talked, his name is Rinieri da Calboli, and Rinieri is actually from Forli, again in Romagna. So they're both Romagnoli from Romagna. So Guido here intervenes and says, if with my understanding I have seized your meaning properly, this word seized, Dante uh, expresses it as accarno, accarno, very uncommon word, which literally means uh, to bite with your teeth on some flesh. So with your the teeth of your brain, because he's talking about understanding your words. So accarno, very interesting. Um, if I understand uh, what you are saying, what you mean, you mean the Arno. He's saying the, the name of the river that Dante referred to. And this is also interesting from a poetic point of view because by saying um, in Darno, two lines above, Dante has basically locked Guido into saying Arno. It's interesting how he's almost uh, saying, but without saying the name of the Arno, Dante. Then Rinieri, the second soul, speaks. And we can see here, again, that his personality is also well-defined. He is uh, rather shy and he doesn't want to, he doesn't feel like speaking directly to Dante. So he speaks to Guido and he says, why did he hide the river's name? Even as one who would do in hiding something horrible from his view. This is uh, not uh, Rinieri being rude, but it's simply, uh, a theatrical way uh, to give Rinieri his own personality and to uh, propel the conversation forward by expressing the thoughts of these characters. Then in verse 28, Guido talks again. And this time he talks to Rinieri directly. They are talking to each other. He says, I do not know, but it is right for such a valley's name to perish. From uh, And he starts uh, a pretty lengthy monologue here. He is, uh, Dante speaking through the mouth of Guido here. And uh, here we have this uh, intense polysemy that I was mentioning at the beginning in the introduction of this video. Dante is uh, describing the course of the river Arno um, by having Guido say, from its source at which the rugged chain surpasses most other places with its mass of mountains. The rugged chain is uh, the 
Apennine, the mountain range uh, from which the Arno is born, is generated. And uh, the rugged chain from which Pelorus was cut off, this in fact uh, is referring to what today we call the Messina Strait between Calabria and Sicily, because the Apennine um, mountain range runs all through Italy, gets to Calabria, and then is interrupted for that little strait, and then it goes on into Sicily. So this is um, what this reference to Pelorus is, because the Pelorus was the northeastern point of Sicily, uh, and today it's actually a spot that's called Punta del Faro. Punta del Faro that I'm happy to show a picture of if I can find another really beautiful location that makes us uh, reflect on uh, how quintessentially Italian the Divine Comedy is um, even before Italy itself was born. Many people, and I, I know I already said it in my videos but I'm going to repeat it, many people believe that Italy was created culturally and literally by literature even before it was created politically. And who created it first? It was Dante. So here we have at least two keys uh, to read the following passage that talks about the course of the Arno and uh, the various animals that uh, Guido mentions and the lack of virtue that is uh, permeating all this area. One is uh, through the eyes of the contemporary history of Dante and his great disappointment in uh, the politicians there, the powerful people, and just in general the human situation of his days. On the other hand, we need to read this uh, incredible description of this river that um, moves almost as if it was an allied character of the canto through Tuscany um, as a clear um, reflection, a clear reference to what we've seen in Canto 14 of Inferno, which is another vertical reading of the Divine Comedy. I said vertical reading, I did this. Uh, another vertical reading of the Divine Comedy, which is really, um, if you remember, um, when we talked about the old man, when Dante presented the Il Grande Veglio, this uh, vision coming from antiquity of uh, this immense statue in Crete with uh, the top made of gold and many other metals and through the fissures and cracks in the statue there were tears coming out and spilling out and uh, the rivers of uh, hell being formed. So 100% Dante is referencing that here. Uh, not only because the number of the canto is the same, 14, and so he is uh, locking this. Uh, let me make a very quick parenthesis, and sorry if I'm going on a, on a tangent here, but this is my, my passion for these things. Sometimes I, I read and I realize these vertical readings, and I, and I think to myself, is it really possible that uh, somebody was as uh, intelligent as to keep all this complex structure in his brain? Um, Maybe it's not. Uh, you, would, you would already need to be a genius simply to do it while you're drawing out uh, such a huge structure on paper. And so it's possible, and I imagine, at the candlelight, this uh, little curved and half-blind Dante alone in a room, full of books around him, but uh, taking notes and maybe writing the title of each uh, or the number of each canto and uh, drawing lines between one and the other, almost drawing a map of his work, of his Divine Comedy. Why not? That's possible. It's also possible that Dante didn't and in fact he was keeping everything in his mind because there are many stories about his flawless memory and his uh, almost uh, in fact being, a, we could say today, a clinical case of, uh, we hear very often about people who have a memory that is eidetic or a memory that doesn't forget anything. Uh, in my opinion, uh, that's what Dante was. Yes, a polymath, and there were many of those in his times, but he had something beyond that. I'm constantly in awe. That's the point of my digression. I'm really in awe um, at what Dante 
brain was able to do and it's clearly coming through through his work so going back to the topic of the infernal river and the reading of this passage through inferno 14 uh, there is actually that angle that key that we can use to to read it and uh, it's not too difficult if we read uh, the the specific animals that are quoted here to go through them and uh, see an actual map of dante's inferno how well the course of the arno in this uh, uh, tercets from uh, line from verse 40 to about 55 where Guido talks about pigs, curs, wolves and foxes seems to really follow the map of Inferno where uh, the pigs would represent the incontinence, the curs would represent the wrathful, the wolves the violent, the murderers as well, and the foxes all that is uh, included in Inferno as within the topic of fraudulence. So it does make sense in terms of a self-reference to uh, his own previous Cantica. On the other hand, from a point of view of the contemporary history and the contemporary people that and towns that he's actually mentioning here, uh, when uh, Dante talk about, and Guido, literally in the, in the dialogue, talks about foul hogs, is talking about the Casentino, the highest area of the Arno, when there are many small towns and the people are in his times were more, uh, uh, let's say, working in farms, etc. He, he calls them hogs, this Guido, more fit for acorns than for fruit. Um, then, as the stream descends, there's a constant uh, sense of descent of the Arno and the river. Um, just like the Infernal River, Dante is still thinking about the analogy and the metaphor for the descent of men, the fall of men, because if we remember the entire elaborate analogy of the old men in Inferno 14 was there to talk about original sin. So if Dante uses a lot of expressions here that talk about descending, going down, 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 etc., etc., is because he is also referring to original sin in a biblical way, in, in a theological way. So we have, the as the stream descends, it comes on curse, uh, that though their force is feeble, they snap and snarl. I love this because I found a note that and in those times, Arezzo, who the Aretini, the people from Arezzo are the curse, Arezzo had a motto in the town. And this motto was, a boar is often caught by a small cur. Really funny if you think about it, because they were trying to be prideful about being, yes, we are smaller than Florence, but we are like a, a cur, because the cur can often catch a boar. It's a motto that Dante certainly had in mind when he decided to call them curs. And uh, scornful of them, it swerves his snout away. There is a moment in the Arno geography, and maybe I can show a map here, where uh, it swerves away, and so Dante, what he does, he is uh, almost giving him a, a psychology as a character, because he's scornful of these people, and so he moves away, up again, and uh, downward, he flows on. And when the ditch, ill-fated and accursed, grows wider, he finds more and more the dogs becoming wolves. Of course, the walls are in Florence, where greed and avarice were found all over. And descending then through many dark ravines, it comes on foxes, so full of deceit. The, this is the people from Pisa. Pisa had this uh, bad reputation for being sly, dishonest and fraudulent in Dante's times. Guido here uh, takes a sudden prophetic stance. And uh, because he's speaking still to Ranieri, he talks about his grandson and he says, I see your grandson, he's become a hunter of wolves along the banks of the fierce river. What, who's, referring, who's Dante referring to here? He's referring to Fulcieri da Calboli. He was a historical, historical character, in fact, he was elected as Podesta, which was a very high political role, the highest political role in Florence that Dante covered before his exile. Fulcieri covered the role just after Dante's exile. And this is why I think Dante is also a little bit bitter about this as well, for this reason as well. 
um, do you notice um, how almost infernal this canto sounds here? We've uh, come to this point without all this type of bitterness and Dante is betraying uh, a level of bitterness in this canto and intensity that we haven't really found in Purgatorio so far. It's very interesting because the next canto of Purgatorio will sound uh, almost uh, as almost like a canto of Paradiso. And so that means that Dante realized what he had done with uh, the canto 14 and maybe he wanted to compensate. So Fulcieri da Calboli was Podesta of Florence in 1303. He persecuted all the enemies of the black in a very, very violent, ruthless way. So as a black Guelph himself, he persecuted all of Dante's friends who were all uh, white Guelphs, just like Dante, and killed them, killed their families, sent them in exile. He was so fierce and ruthless that the, the other black Guelphs in power in Florence allowed him to reign as Podesta in Florence for another six months or so, or maybe one year longer. So he gained the praises and the privilege from the Black Wells for his ruthlessness. This quick vignette, vignette that we can see from verse 61 to 65, it's almost um, an infernal vignette, a uh, scene from, uh, from Inferno. This, uh, he sells their flesh while they're still alive. Like an ancient beast, he turns to slaughter depriving many of life, himself of honor, bloody, he comes out from the wood his plunder, this wood is Florence, all full of blood, living is such that in a thousand years it will not be the forest that it was. The level of uh, darkness here is not very aligned with the beauty of Purgatorio. Let's also try to take a, a step back when it comes to this bitterness but on Dante's part and uh, understand the background. He is, uh, he is not only an intensely bitter person because of his exile. We need to understand that he's talking about his historic reality. And within his political vision, what he's telling us here is, has very much to do with his reality and with his political vision, because he's talking about uh, the lack of morals and the decline, the decline of morals all through these regions, Tuscany and Romagna, that followed some very specific historic events. The turn of events uh, in Dante's view, and uh, in many's view, in fact, is the fact that the uh, progressive loss of uh, imperial power in northern and central Italy had given rise to the power of little, like he calls them, hogs, little powerful people who did everything they wanted in their small group of towns or small group of uh, even quarters sometimes. So Dante's bitterness is about these people, these powerful people who are almost disconnected completely from uh, the emperor and they are only talking and only thinking about their own local political power. The first part of the canto it has this uh, particular mood and this particular tone of bitterness for what is there. The second part of the canto we'll see uh, is much more focused on uh, what a certain, a certain sense of nostalgia for the old values, the knightly values, the courtly values that were there uh, until somebody like Frederick II, for example, as an emperor, was there. The real crisis was at its peak or maybe was triggered by the death of Frederick II with the lack of that imperial, the last imperial power in Italy, in the peninsula, Everybody was free to do whatever they want, and they were these uh, feral beasts going around and just thinking about their little world. After this long monologue by Guido, Dante feels like he wants to know who these two souls are. And uh, in a very uh, purgatorio style, meaning in an open, kind way, uh, Guido says, you'd have me do for you that which to me you have refused. You have refused to actually tell me your name. But uh, since God would in you have his grace glow so brightly, I shall not be miserly. I'm going to tell you who I am. I was. I was Guido del Duca. As I, as I mentioned before, Guido del Duca was a powerful person, politician from uh, Forlì, from Romagna. He was a Ghibellin. And uh, he was fairly popular in his times. Um, obviously, he finds himself uh, in uh, Purgatorio, so he wasn't 
a really bad person under Dante's judgment, but uh, he must have done something uh, envious because he says, my blood was so afire with envy that when I had seen a man becoming happy, the lividness in me was plain to see. And then he um, is quoting a sentence from uh, St. Paul in the New Testament. He says, from what I've sown, this is the straw I reap. O humankind, why do you set your hearts there where our sharing cannot have a part? This is a crucial verse because in the next canto, Purgatorio 15, uh, Virgil and Dante will talk about uh, precisely this line by Guido. Dante will ask Virgil what Guido meant by saying this, in saying this, and Virgil will try to explain to him. Um, at the end of Virgil's explanation, which would be beautiful, Virgil will conclude his explanation by saying another time, but talk to Beatrice about this. She will uh, explain it better to you because she goes beyond what is uh, rational logic, which is incarnated by Virgil. Guido then introduces Rinieri. This is Rinieri, uh, the glory, the honor of the house of Calboli. But no one has inherited his worth. Dante is introducing here a theme that he has touched on before, even in Purgatorio, which is the value, the uh, type of nobility of soul that uh, in some families, in many families, he noticed that it kind of tends to wane uh, generation after generation. And this is what uh, happened to Rainier's family. His uh, progeny is not as noble and uh, good as he was, as he was. Here Guido starts uh, um, what we can consider the second part of this canto, which is uh, a sort of invective about the moral decadence and moral corruption of Romagna. But uh, instead of focusing, in terms of the tone and the sentiment here, instead of focusing on the bitterness uh, of the contemporary present, just like the first part about Tuscany was focused on, here the focus is more about on the past. It's uh, the prevalent sentiment of the second part of this canto is really nostalgia and uh, regret for uh, beautiful bygone times when people had these knightly and courtly values and today their progeny don't have them anymore. To create these passages, Dante uses a biblical formula, a formula that is used in the, in the Old Testament as well, which is called ubi sunt, which means in Latin, where are they, um, for evoking the, worth, the worthies of the past. And uh, this constant repetition of uh, where is good Lizio? Where will a Fabro flourish? Where is this person? Where is the other person who have gone by? Is has biblical tones, just like the just like Guido was prophetic in tone a few paragraphs before. Now he's uh, uh, almost imitating a certain biblical tone. And uh, as I mentioned before, we this entire canto has this chiaroscuro um, play between the the righteous anger towards the present and the moral corruption of the present, and this type of sweet nostalgia uh, for the times gone, gone by and past. Now, at this point, it's, uh, I think, fairly easy for us reading this canto to think, well, I'm really reading somebody who almost sounds like a grumpy old man complaining about the present and uh, giving, a, giving his nephew the kind of good old days type of speech. Very typical, right? It's something that we've all witnessed, maybe within our families or with, with some people. And um, it's uh, really great what Father Pearson, in his uh, uh, Spiritual Direction for Dante book about uh, Purgatorio, um, writes as a reflection about this point when writing about Purgatorio 14. Father Pearson says, it seems to be a fairly common aspect of growing older that we begin to see the world in which we had formerly placed so much youthful hope as becoming impossibly degenerate. It happens to everyone. How difficult it can be to watch society dramatically decline from its former glory, living as a faithful soul on earth or just a soul full of hope, let's say, political hope, and uh, sometimes even living faithfully in the church itself from a priest's point of view, 
it seems to have as part of the job description the responsibility to look on while the world is going to hell in a handbasket now he's right this is a very common human attitude as we grow older um, it's very easy to fall into this uh, sensation because the it's the compensation for having had so much so many high hopes as uh, as young people uh, at the same time it's also something that uh, Dante is doing with a view to always focused on his mission on what he's writing and uh, and so he wants to uh, with this poem he wants to shock people back into the right direction into the right values he is uh, certainly not only simply complaining about the past and uh, uh, in a in a simplistic way i would also add that uh, maybe as a personal note when thinking about this type of uh, good old days syndrome there is a sense of uh, blaming uh, political parties political figures uh, powerful people individuals that is always present and uh, and that can really weigh on our soul on our shoulders as something like a dark cloud every day uh, it doesn't matter where you are because I've seen it in Italy I've seen it in the UK I've seen it in Germany I've seen it in Sp everywhere everywhere in the US um, my take on this is that uh, as I personally grow older um, I don't uh, dis disregard this type of attitude because it's a very human so we are all part of this however the the more I try uh, to make the effort to make the effort to find responsibility in myself rather than than in other people i try to take the solgenitsyn type of direction which is difficult but uh, i really believe it i really believe that uh, it's first of all in uh, improving yourself in the very little things that you maybe think are completely inconsequential in your day that you're gonna make a huge great change in the world and uh, it's also part of uh, Christian doctrine and of many religious do doctrines as well. It reminds me of uh, some uh, letters by St. Ignatius that I read as well. So this was my little parenthesis about uh, collective, political and personal responsibility. In his invective, Guido is, uh, let's say, almost depressing himself, poor Guido. He's crying. The more he talks, the more he cries. And uh, he's saying here at verse 124, Tuscan, go your way. I am more pleased to weep now than to speak. I cannot speak anymore. I just want to weep by myself. Poor Guido. For that which we have spoken presses heavily on me. This is a, a feeling, a sentiment that is uh, appropriate for Purgatorio. Is this type of empathetic sorrow that Guido is feeling and that reflects his uh, spiritual pur purification from uh, his feelings of envy. So Dante and Virgil proceed in silence and Dante um, mentions silence on purpose because what happens here is uh, a couple of uh, separate uh, thunderous sounds thunderous uh, auditory hallucinations we can call it a voice that seemed like lightning as it splits the air encountered us a voice that said whoever captures me will slaughter me this is the voice of Cain from the Old Testament Another sound, like thunder, quick to follow thunder, goes, I am a Glorus, who was turned to stone. This is a, another reference to mythology. Uh, a Glorus was uh, a woman who was so envious of her sister, her sister was Hersey, um, who was in love with Mercury, with the god Mercury. And so a Glorus, uh, according to the story, stopped in front of Mercury's door, therefore not allowing her sister to get in and have love with Mercury. For this type of uh, sin, of envy, she was turned to stone. And the canto ends uh, with uh, uh, an elevation, a poetic elevation. Uh, Dante uses Virgil here to elevate the end of the canto uh, because Virgil told him, that is the sturdy bit that should hold every man within his limits. But you would take the bait so that the hook of the old adversary draws you to him. Something important to note here is the difference between God seen as a falconer, 
because that's the word that uh, Dante is using, the richiamo. Richiamo was a technical term within falconry at, in those times. So Dante uh, is talking about God as the falconer and man as his hawk, who has the free will to respond to the richiamo, to the call of God. While on the, on the other side, there is Satan, who has the hook, and uh, the hook of the old adversary, Satan, draws you to him. You see the difference between the call of God that implies free will and the hook of Satan that doesn't really imply the free will and so it just hooks you up whenever he has the opportunity. The four final verses are glorious, just glorious. Heaven would call and it encircles you. It lets you see its never-ending beauties and yet your eyes would only see the ground. Thus, he who sees all things would strike you down. The emphasis in Dante's original version is not on God striking down men, but in the fact that God sees everything. It's a little different because the English translation ending on that strike you down makes it a little bit dark. Uh, the Italian ending of the canto ends on a positive note. Uh, yes, God is uh, beating and in the sense of uh, sending to hell whoever deserves it, but uh, the point that Dante is making here is about looking up instead of looking down. And uh, it's an encouragement that comes from Virgil, still Dante's great master, even in this terrace, and still encouraging him, uh, trying to encourage him to do the right thing. Really lovely, glorious, magnificent canto. Uh, I enjoyed this one very much, and uh, I hope this was uh, a helpful couple of thoughts from me to you as we proceed in this uh, in this journey thank you all